Welcome to the Baltimore Game Developer Community Building Panel, starring our special guest panelists. Uh, if you guys could take a few minutes to introduce yourself, your work, and, well, I guess both your game development work as well as your community building work. That would be a great start, I think. Okay. Starting with Tronster. Okay. Everyone, my name is Tronster. I work up at Firaxis Games in uh, Sparks, Maryland doing uh, work on a variety of platforms, PlayStation 3, PC, Xbox, iPhone, uh, at one time Facebook. And uh, I've been doing video games since about the early 2000s as an indie, professionally since about 06, where I started working on breakaway games and uh, was working as a user interface programmer on Command and Conquer King's Wrath. And I'm also the chair of the Baltimore chapter of the IGDA, which is the International Game Developers Association. And hopefully between being in indie, doing stuff on nights and weekends, uh, helping out with endeavors such as the Indie Showcase at MAGFest, and uh, as well as my professional experience being a AAA developer, I can share what I know about uh, Baltimore and why I think it's a great development. Hi, my name is Sam Batista. Uh, I'm also employed at Firaxis Games, working on the XCOM project. Um, I run the Be More Indie Games, BIG, which is a organization, a local organization focused on improving the independent development scene here in Baltimore. Uh, and that's, that's about it. I think my credentials speak for themselves, and I, I think uh, I, I bring... I'm gonna kill you! Silence <laughs> that cell phone. Um, I really have a passion for independent games. I love indie games, and I started big because I wanted to hang out with people uh, that shared like, that, that had like-minded, uh, that, that shared my passion. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll continue to grow and, and make Baltimore a really safe haven for independent developers in the future. I'm uh, Gabriel Pendleton, and I guess my uh, claim to fame is uh, BaltimoreGamer.com. Um, I started the website to cover and document the local scene um, in terms of AAA and indie uh, in Baltimore. Um, besides that, I've done some development work um, at a company called Anto International, where I worked on casino games. Um, and I also worked for a company called uh, Peervine Games. We had Facebook stuff there. Uh, also, uh, Bully Entertainment, where I worked on uh, games in mainly in Unity, doing uh, educational and learning simulations. Um, and so that's kind of my background. I mean, uh, I'm just a community builder. I've worked with the, I've been on the board of the IGDA myself also. Um, so I have mainly focused on Great, well welcome all you guys and welcome everybody. So the we have some pre-arranged questions that we were gonna run through first, and then we would open up the uh, the questions to the audience. So uh, the first question is what do you see as the biggest strengths of Baltimore's game developer community? I'd say I think the biggest strength that we have is a large amount of game developers who had a history of developing games resident in the immediate Baltimore area. And a lot of people are surprised at the number of game studios that are up in the Hunt Valley, Timonian, Sparks area. And not only do we have about, I think, half a dozen of people who have made, who have studios where they make their livelihood making games, but then we also have a variety of studios downtown or other types of businesses which are looking to get into games or starting to explore video games. It's created this whole ecosystem so that despite the dynamics and the volatility of the game industry, that there are other places for developers to go should their studio close or if they have layoffs or if they just want to look for new opportunities. And adding that layer of stability allows for people to, to in turn, have uh, deeper roots within Baltimore itself, such as instead of just renting, they now have an option of buying a house because they 
don't have to think, well, I might be having to move in six months. And it, it just, it begats itself. And while there are many things that I think make the community fantastic and great here, I think that's probably the crux, the biggest thing that we have going for us here in Baltimore that a lot of other cities, particularly on the East Coast, do not have. In addition to uh, a sizable amount of established developers that make games professionally and sell them um, and make their living that way, I also, I feel and I, I know there's a large amount of untapped potential here in Baltimore. Um, my community, Be More Indie Games, you know, it, it started off as just a bunch of friends hanging out together, but hanging out with these people that might not necessarily develop games full time like I do, um, has given me a window into some of these people's skills and talents, and it's, it's really impressive to see that even as hobbyists or students, there are a lot of people that have tremendous skill and, and talent that they don't use to make commercial video games, but they could. Um, in addition to that, Baltimore is a city that is economically ravaged, okay? It's not like, it, it's not a, a poor city, you know, but it is a, a city where a lot, of, a lot of large enterprises left. And that creates an opportunity Okay, that creates uh, lots of opportunities in terms of finding cheap office space, in terms of finding people that are willing to collaborate um, or, or offer, you, offer developers uh, places to congregate, places to get together um, for free or for very low cost. So it's, it's a city that is full of opportunity and full of talent. Um, and it's, it's just waiting to, it's, it's, we, we need to, you know, Get, get the experienced developers working with the less, less experienced people to create games and, and to hopefully increase the health of the scene. Um, I think one of the biggest strengths is, is that it's a small community. And the reason I say that is because um, you develop relationships with people over time and years that uh, they turn into many things. And because of that, it breeds a lot of collaboration. Um, it also, it, there's a lot of chances that, um, you know, later down the line, they'll, you'll do a show at one event, they say, hey, you should also come out and do this event. And so you have this snowball effect of getting your project in multiple places because at the end of the day, people really, really care about your project because um, you usually care about something that's close to you, right? And your next door neighbor, you're gonna care about them more than someone you know about in, you know, in New York or California. Um, many times, me and Sam, me and Tronster, we, we'll sit down, we'll talk about a lot of things, or they'll offer advice to each other, or they'll be the first ones to share your stuff on, you know, the social media accounts, and, or uh, be the person to vouch for you. And I think it's because, you know, it's, it's very tight niche, and so you want that next person next to you uh, to succeed, so that's what I was saying. And I think that's, like, that's key, too, that Baltimore, it definitely has the small to more effect in the game industry. If you don't know people in the game industry, but you're passionate about video games, and you start hanging out with any one of the groups, whether it be big or the IGDA, or just going to events like this, it's amazing how many faces you start seeing over and over again. You might decide to go and do a game jam, and then at a game jam, you can see some people that you know. You go to Otakon, and then you start running into other people. They might be hanging out with some other game developer friends. Uh, last night, um, after doing some late work, I went down to Joe Square to meet a friend, and when I went down there, um, sure enough, there were some guys from Secret New Code there, uh, and I just wasn't expecting it, and they were hanging out, and I met some more people from that company there as well. So, it's, you know, anyone who works in the game industry in Baltimore is only a stone's throw away. You just have to walk around and just be very careful what you say when you're getting Indian food at lunch, because who knows who's going to be sitting at the table like, <laughs> Great. Uh, so, on the flip side of that coin, what do you see as the biggest weaknesses or opportunities for Baltimore's game developer community? Um, I would say, you say the biggest opportunities. Um, I would think, uh, for me, I think there needs to be a bigger outreach into in terms of diversity. Uh, I think especially like women and, uh, for me, people of minority coming in. Um, but I don't think that's just the game issue. I think it's a tech 
industry issue period. But um, especially then that there's a lot of companies in Baltimore, there needs to be more companies like going into the, like the community doing outreach and like um, getting people like really early and teaching them that these are avenues that you can go into. And usually that's done at the college level. And but you know by that time you know everybody's kind of know what they're doing. So I think it has to start a little earlier. So I think if you have more outreach at those early points, um, and there's already groups like the FDA and and they cool, like, you know, accepts anyone, you know, to come out and learn about games. But I think it's an increased and consistent effort um, on that. And um, and I think uh, just the, uh, you know, not for everyone to sit out on silos and islands. Because I think sometimes people can have groups that they want to start, but, like, don't reach out to other groups because, you know, they want to build their own thing for whatever reason. But I think uh, something like that would help. So while trying to set up big and, and try to grow the community, uh, ran into several challenges in, in the Baltimore area. And I think one of them is, is money. Money is always a problem. Uh, and it's the companies that operate as video game studios, they tend to be isolated and they tend to be, you know, they, they tend to just do what brings revenues and not necessarily reach out or not necessarily um, open their doors and invite, invite people in to, you know, sort of get an introduction to the game industry. But along those lines, it, it seems to me that the, the companies and the people that are successful don't, don't necessarily tend to reach out as much because they sort of found a formula. You know, they sort of found their niche, their market, and they know what they're doing. Um, at the same time, small independent developers uh, and, you know, the traditional indie game developer Usually, they're small companies. They're five to ten people. Um, they might not have a lot of money to start off with. They might not even know where to get money to start off with. Um, and some other cities, some other locales have sort of addressed that issue uh, by providing government funding or by providing accelerators or by having universities that are directly um, involved in building up a local business community. Um, but it seems to me that Baltimore um, does not have that, that uh, structure yet. Uh, we don't have uh, accelerators you know, or, or incubators for video game developers. Um, and I think that's one opportunity uh, that we, 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 should try to, um, we should try to tap into. It has, uh, that, has, that has got to come from the game industry too, because I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, but a few years ago, the state of Maryland actually was actively trying to pursue, to woo game development studios to come to Maryland. And they even had a booth at GDC, the, the Game Developers Conference on the West Coast. And it was weird because you've got all these companies like Autodesk is out there, and you've got um, Gabriel with their engine there, and then you've got Maryland. It's like, hey, <laughs> we're, we're, we're Maryland. People are like, well, okay, that's fantastic. But, and I think. A lot of people who were in the government realized what the potential was, and just as you said, like they realized that this is a it's a, a hot industry. It's an industry that can bring revenue in for the state, and they wanted to help facilitate uh, a way for studios to come into the state. But at the time, it was done, as far as I know, it was done devoid of any interaction with any of the local studios. The IGDA chapter in Baltimore hadn't existed, a lot of the personal connections didn't exist, and they just thought, we need to bring some studios in. And the existing studios that were in Baltimore had no input, could not shape or help drive them in a way that would be successful. So they did that while their irons were hot, and then they cooled, and that whole endeavor went down. But I think recreating or rebuilding and enthusiasm for that type of deal, or at the very least, creating a fund like what Georgia did recently and offering, I think, $25 million in was it tax credits or uh, for game studios to come on board. Even something along that lines that would be enticing for uh, a studio to set up shop, I mean, a big studio. And I think Baltimore is in a good place for small studios. There are a lot of places for small studios to rent some space or get free space, but big studio-wise, like big corporations, you know, something that's um, 
an established LLC or even beyond that, I don't know if Baltimore is really set up in a way that would offer some unique business opportunities for a game studio. Um, they have the exact same opportunities as anyone else who is setting up a business inside of Baltimore. I do want to disagree with Sam on one thing, though. I do think the big studios do get back to the community. Because, I mean, they can only do it in such a way that makes sense for them, but um, our studio for Axis has opened their doors on multiple occasions for a variety of activities, including the IGDA. And when I've had educators come through to try to help bridge the gap between their programs and what the studios were looking for. I had uh, Zenga East at the time, Firaxis and Breakaway Games all open their doors to go and give tours of all these educators to see how their studios work and talk to them a little bit about it. But the amount of time that these big studios can offer, I think, is not the same amount of like one-on-one -on -one hands-on development time, which is what the indie studios can do. And if, I think it only makes sense. I don't know if there's a way that large studios would be able to give more and still be able to, um, I don't know what you'd say, turn up a profit, not give away any of the, the secrets uh, I think, um, they would need to be successful and not close shop. I think um, one of the things, because I walk the line between like the tech industry and the, the game community, and I think in a lot of ways they kind of mirror each other, but also need to borrow some things from one another. Um, like Sam talked about in terms of like uh, accelerators and um, incubators and stuff like that. There's so many in the tech community, like it's just a lot of saturation. But the fact that they have so many, uh, so many options for like if you want to create apps and stuff to go do, is a is a great thing. And there are uh, organizations out there that are willing to give you those funds. There are other companies that have like, you know, they work on the second floor, but they the first floor they're not really using it. So they'll let a company come in and say, hey, just work out of our basement floor and bring in your team and you know and they'll work out something there. So um, like if there was more stuff like that, I think that they took from the game industry and uh, you know that would definitely I mean from the tech industry and they incorporated into the game industry that would definitely help us. I'm gonna continue on that point and uh, my my audience, you know, the, the people that I mainly work with represent in terms of big are small Small developers are most of the times they're students or they're people who do this part time and they might have a project that's fairly far along, but they don't really know how to how to close it, how to how to take it to the next level, how to take it to market, um, or they they might have a difficulty finding the time to continue development on these titles to put in the last eight, the last twenty percent, the polish phase of the game that really takes a long time, and to do that. You know, they, they just they need time. They need they need uh, the security. They need money to do those types of things. Um, and that's that's the part where that I think Baltimore isn't doing enough. Uh, and I I brought with me a few examples of you know organizations that are set up not just in this country but uh, in you know in Canada and in France um, that really do provide these these facilities. For example, um, there's an execution labs in Montreal. They incubate, they accelerate, they fund, and they publish, and they provide co-working spaces, all for you know maybe a, a, a fee or or like a, um, some kind of royalty program once the, the games are out. There's a Glitch City, which is a non-profit member-driven co-op in Los Angeles. There's Buffalo Game Space, a free to the public sponsor-driven co-working space in New York. Indy City Co-op in Chicago, same thing, developer-driven co-working space. Philly Game Forge in Philadelphia. There's not a lot of information on this, they just started up. Um, there's the Indie Game Collective in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dutch Game Garden uh, in Digital City in Northeast England. So there's a lot of organizations sort of springing up to incubate, to provide um, guidance, to provide some funds to allow smaller developers, usually teams of one to four people, to complete their projects, to put the polish and to take them to market. And I think that's what's missing here in Baltimore, is uh, the assistance for smaller developers to be able to take a risk and, and to put a game uh, and to complete their projects and to you know form companies. Uh, and I think bigger studios do play a role, in it, especially in, in the education department and in incentivizing schools 
uh, to have good programs and, and to give the right education, because it is in their best interest to do that, to have uh, you know, well-trained uh, college graduates come out. But at the same time, like Tronser said, bigger, bigger studios, bigger companies, they have a focus in completing projects and taking them to market. So they don't really have, uh, it's not in their best interest to promote smaller developers and, and to, to promote the competition, essentially, you know. Um, but I, I do believe that here we, we need, uh, smaller developers need to have a safety net. And we need to figure out a way to provide this safety net so that projects can, be, can get completed, companies can get created, and jobs can be, you know, they can be created as part of that. So before we move on, could, could you, uh, there was a definition like spread out throughout the whole conversation, but could you clarify exactly what you mean by incubators and accelerators? Like what exactly is an incubator? So accelerator? Um, uh, accelerator is kind of like, um, they basically, usually they'll give you some startup funds and it's maybe 20K or 25K. And it's like a six month program, it can be longer, they can give you more money dependent. And they basically, they're on you every day you're in this program. And they're taking you from um, beginning of the product probably to like MVP, which is the minimum viable product, you know, your demo, your like, you know, what you're gonna probably take to the next level. But they run you through business, they put you in front of investors, they train you, like get you in front of lawyers so you can get all the business stuff handled. And for that six months, they're on you every day because they want to make that return back on their money. But um, it's a way to like be ahead of the game, and you come out so much uh, better on the other end of it. And I guess you can take the you Yeah, I mean, um, all of the examples that that I, I mentioned, they all have sort of a different approach. Okay, they all um, some of them provide money, some of them only provide a working environment. Some of them only provide a meeting space, okay? But at the end of the day, all of these programs are, are set in place to mentor younger developers or inexperienced developers through the production phase of a, of, of a project. You know, anybody can put together a prototype at a game jam, but to complete one, to complete a game that's ready to go to market and compete and make revenues, that is a totally different ballgame. So these programs are, are, are put in place by experienced developers who mentor um, younger developers, younger developers, and in a lot of times the successful ones, the very successful programs, fund these developers through the production of the game. Um, for example, I know the Dutch Game Garden, they actually have a, a program in place where for the first two months of development, they will pay you $600 a month, and then uh, once you complete a prototype and, and they, they, deem, they deem the prototype ready to go into production, they continue to fund the game and they continue to fund the developer, um, but they increase it to $800 a month or, or maybe they'll allow you to have one more person on the team um, to continue the development of the game. And then they'll take a royalty at the end, say 5% or 10% of what the game makes. Um, and they mentor you not just through the development of the game, but most important through the development stages of the company. Setting up the LLC, setting up the uh, how the how the revenues are going to be split, setting up you know basically mentoring and guiding these these young developers on the perils of you know navigating the business of developing and selling games. Right. So there's the the actual specifics of how they are implemented vary wildly, but at the end of the day, it's basically providing funds, providing guidance. Um, to developers to complete a project and take it to market. All right. So, um, totally different. So, <laughs> well together. Uh, so, how can local news sources like BaltimoreGamer.com change the way both professionals and the general public think about the local game developer community? So, when I answer this question, um, I want to kind of answer it on a broad scale. Um, mainly because Baltimore Gamer is just one of many local news sources. In Baltimore, I managed to you know make it to like the only site that covered like local news in terms of games and stuff like that. Um, but we've always tried to take the human interest piece and cover the people behind the product. So 
if people are looking into the city and they're, you know, saying who are the people there, you know, what project are there, are there like, are there the people there? Is it a collaborative city? Is it active? Um, and that's the kind of information we always wanted to put out there. Um, so, um, also, it can be a place to provide resources. So, there may be a lot of groups out there that actually get big, but how do I find this? Like, if I'm new to Baltimore and just coming in, um, how do I know about game design degrees and programs and stuff like that that's out there? So, you know, it can be also a place for like a hub to find, to be a hub of information for people who want to find, uh, you know, how to get into those avenues. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, local news sources are usually there. They usually know a story before it breaks. I can guarantee if you track any story back, it can go back to a local news source first. And that's usually because, again, it's going back to the thing, you know, you care about your next door neighbor. Like, I care about your project because I want to talk about it more than the next person. You know, I'm going to be your uh, evangelist, you know. So, and that's uh, what I think, and then it just leads to a snowball effect. You know, one, it starts there, and somebody else picks it up, and then the next thing you know, it's, you know, it's mainstream, so. I think uh, it really helps from a discoverability standpoint, right? Because, especially in the mobile games market, it's very difficult to be noticed. It's very difficult to get the first 100 players. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to grow beyond that. So if you have several news sources that you know, are able to promote you initially, it's just a big help for any developer that basically does not have a wide reach yet. Um, at the same time, finding out where, where the, the developers meet, where to hang out, what the groups are, that's also extremely important because if someone wants to get involved and doesn't necessarily know who to talk to, where to go, um, how to get you know how to get information? That's just super useful and critical. Um, but it's it, it's a it's a tough problem to solve because um, a lot of times running a, a website or running a news a news organization that tries to you know raise the awareness or, or put people on the spotlight that takes a lot of time that takes a lot of effort and uh, none of us are at least I'm not getting paid to do big and I know. Uh, Gabe doesn't get paid to do Baltimore Gamers, so it's you know it's a lot of time and a lot of effort that you end up putting, and then it's it's just difficult um, to be continuously invested in that. Um, but I do believe it's really important to have at least a source of or, or a place where you can go to get the information about who's who or what events are happening and, and how you can get involved. I'm going to get ties to, to Baltimore. I have one concrete example. Every year when I go to GDC, and this year was no exception, get there, I'm chatting with people, I say, hey, you know, Tronster, Fraxis Games, I'm like, wait a minute, do you have a podcast? And at one time, I did a podcast called the Basement Game Dev Podcast with Brett from uh, Wargaming West, and all the episodes are hosted on Baltimore Gamers. They're still up there now. And I realized that even though I'm over in San Francisco, I've had multiple people um, listen to this, and you know, Baltimore is prominently displayed inside of all the literature for the podcast. It's on BaltimoreGamer.com. We get game de other game developers from the Baltimore scene, from all the other local studios, and bring them in. And so, in that sense, we're able to both contribute to the game community at large because we're providing a service. As Sam said, we, we're not getting paid. I tried getting, I tried not getting paid, I tried just to go and get some Amazon list, list items for like microphones and whatnot, and like no, nothing came through. So don't quite know how you like track <laughs> that egg to like get sponsorship on a podcast. But you know, for over a year, we were able to go and put out episodes to give people information about game development, from guys' perspectives, from women's perspectives, from uh, minorities, from indies, from triple A's, from artists, from programmers, you know, out there, globally accessible. And then at the same time, it's all coming from Baltimore. Everyone listening to the podcast is hearing that all this is all taking place with game developers in the Baltimore area. And that just promotes Baltimore as a city, which, which I'm happy because the city, even beyond games, is a lot going for it. I mean, besides the great ice cream at the Charmery and Crab Cakes. You know, I, I like Baltimore a lot, so it's great to know that other game developers are hearing positive things about Baltimore, and you know, it might make them intrigued to take a, a trip out here and, 
and see, see what we have to offer, or at least would have them consider twice if they were going to take a position at a studio. If they have an offer at Bungie, and they have an offer at Zenimax. You know, maybe Bungie would be the only one, but now you know, Zenimax is in Baltimore. They hear about this live, lively game development scene. It's like, oh, maybe I'll look at the Zenimax offer as well, too. And that will provide, that is basically a magnet for bringing more talent into our local region. Great. So, uh, what are some ways that IGDA and VMware Indie Games are bringing together and building up the Baltimore game developer, game developer community right now? Like what, do you guys, what are some initiatives that you guys carry out right now as organizations? So I, I just want to mention that VMware Indie Games is fairly recent, right? So we've, we've just, uh, we started getting organized last year and we're, we're going to continue to um, try to get more organized and, and grow our numbers. But uh, we've ran, so far we ran one game jam and was very successful. We had 35 people in attendance around um, six or seven projects that were completed and that was really fun. Uh, and we also hosted, along with IGDA, uh, a game showcase at the wind-up space here in Baltimore. Um, and it was a huge success. I think we had you know 60 or 70 people come out and play games and hang out and drink beer and, and socialize and that was super fun. So we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to organize showcases, make sure that the local independent developers um, that might not otherwise have an avenue to show their games get to show their games in public and get some feedback. Um, and we're going to continue to doing game jams because those are super fun and it's a great way for someone who has never made a game to get involved and, and find out what it takes. Um, and going forward, you know, we're looking to provide also some educational components, um, teaching people how to use Unity or how to use certain things, uh, how to make, how to program or how to make graphics, how to collaborate, I don't know. Um, we're looking at ways to expand our reach and expand our influence um, by providing services to our community and our organization. And I think in the future, um, collaboration between the groups, whether it's IGDA or whether it's Baltimore Unites, which is a, a, a recent organization that came together, they just meet up and talk about unity. Um, I think collaboration between our various organizations is going to be key because if we want to have a cohesive game development scene here in Baltimore um, and, and to have the numbers, you know, to really grow and, and continue to expand our influence, then we're going to need to work together and figure out a way to uh, partner up and, and do bigger and better things. Right. And I think that just because we have this proximity to each other, um, you know, a lot of our, we're all in Baltimore. Uh, heck, Sam and I, proximity is about 50 feet away or 100 feet away from each other since we work in the same office. But um, opportunities that may come up from one organization or the other that may be a fit, um, we definitely throw back and forth. Like we had the, as Sam mentioned, the joint endeavor for an indie showcase. And uh, more recently, we're starting to look at some opportunities that might occur at MAGFest, like some bigger things that have not occurred before. Um, and yeah, some educational things maybe along the lines of, um, we're looking at some ways that we could get some, some opportunities to show some content that other people may not have access to unless they actually go out to, to GDC. So there are, it's been a relatively new partnership, or I shouldn't say partnership, but new, what, what do you call it? Collaboration. Yeah, collabor yeah. a series of collaborations on there. But um, I think because a lot of what each organization is striving to do is basically empower game developers, with the difference being that indie, uh, with big, really pushing to go and do an awesome job at bringing up the indies, and IGDA is just taking a, a broader sense, and not going as deep on the indies, but also being open for everyone. Like, both of us wanting to go and make better game developers, which in turn makes for better games, um, is allowing us to, uh, yeah, it's allowing us to continue to collaborate, and really the only thing we're limited, limited by is, I was gonna say, time and money, time and money, but I guess those are kind of big factors, aren't they? But you know, we're, we're, we're working on that. Um, for me, it's always going to be uh, outreach and expansion. 
I think um, because we're a small market, one of the things we have to do is expand, but we have to expand by doing that outreach. Um, and we have to consistently be in the schools talking to students, letting students know that these organizations exist. Like, this is where you go if you want to get more advice. This is where you go if you want to find out about your information or get guidance. Um, so it has to be like consistent so that people, you know, our groups now can, you know, go from 500 members to, you know, 600 members and 700 and grow and keep growing. Um, and and it get, could, because we're small, I think it can be easy to be like, well, we have enough people coming to our events, you know, but it's <laughs> not about just the people that come consistently. It's about gaining new members so that way you have new ideas, new people who want to take over as the, the top people, like, leave the position, you know. Um, and, and that, you know, I think that is what I care about the most is like, you know, getting, getting the outside of Baltimore to actually see our success. So, you know, um, we have like the, the showcases and stuff like that. Like, why can't we open it up to bigger people? You know, it's the, those are the questions I ask myself all the time when I'm like, thinking about like, how can I, you know, show the rest of the world, you know, what's going on. And what can individual students do now to help Baltimore's game developer community strengthen tomorrow? I think making games is like one of is one of many things. I and mean, that sounds kind of weird, but by making games is the best tool for teaching how to make a game. And also also opens oneself up for collaboration because now you can actually mention a real world problem, a real world real world experience with other developers, even if it's other students or other indies, particularly if it's other triple A's. And so if students push to go beyond um, just the classroom project, take that project after the classroom and continue to work on it or start something from scratch uh, or do a project at a game jam, but then continue it afterwards and look to actually take a product to make it go to market. A very simple product, but still a product nonetheless. I think it would do a great boost to empower them and as well as open a variety of doors amongst the development community inside of Baltimore and even potentially create new studios that would house other developers to latch on with the work of the one developer who's leading the charge. And from my perspective, you know, get involved. Find out, you know, find find out where these things are happening, where people are meeting, where people where the showcases are happening, where the game jams are happening, where the meetups are happening. Um, because, and, and start making friendships. Start talking with people and, and, you know, getting to know us. Because that's really, I think, for me, the reward comes from hanging out with people that love to make games, love to play games. That is, that is the coolest feeling. You know, recently we partnered up with Pure Band Studios and we host uh, monthly dev nights there. And we, all we do is we get, you know, 10 people come to this company and sit down and work on their own projects and, and just hang out. And it's so much fun. You know, I always leave there with a smile on my face. Um, and I just, I want to see that continue. You know, I want to open up the doors to more people so that they could have the opportunity to get involved, come hang out, have fun, make games, play games, and really find out that there's an active community here in Baltimore of game developers that are trying to take it to the next level. So I'm going to call someone out right now. Paul back there, uh -oh. who goes to UMBC. This guy is one of the most active students I've seen uh, in the community. He's always out at events, always showing his games off. Today I said to him, I was like, you get working on another game? Every time I see him, he has a different game that he's working on. And they're like stuff that he's just, you know, he finds the time to put all this work into it, do school, and then he still comes out and, you know, and gets out there, learn what's going on in the community. And it's just like really being active and, you know, getting outside the house, you know. I mean, you can sit there and make the game all day, but if nobody knows what you're doing or you're not getting advice and you're not being involved in the community, then you're just a, you know, a lone person on the island. So, you know, I think um, just being active, again, being active, uh, wanting to collaborate with other people in the community, just knowing what's out there. So, I guess what you can do like, to better yourself as a student. So. All right. So, uh, now, you know, we got some, a fair bit of time left. For any questions from the audience members? I got one question, just uh, some fun speculation. So, Unity, 
It's this big, big thing that's taking over everywhere. So obviously a lot of people really love it. We probably all love it a lot. Um, but do you see like some potential like, I don't know, like proclaimed disaster in the future? Like, you know, what is the worst that could happen from like this, you know, behemoth of a game engine that's taking over everywhere? I don't, I don't think you're going to see like any disaster or any big, you okay. know, like big developer exodus leaving Unity. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's such an established platform at this point. But at the same time, you have to understand that game development is a business. And like any business, people will go and use the tools that will allow them to be the most successful. So for example, Unreal Engine 4 just opened up the doors to anybody that wants to pay $20 a month. And if you pay $20 a month, you get the access to all the source of the Unreal Engine. And if you've ever played a game made by Unreal, let me tell you, they usually look really good because, <laughs> because they're, they're, the content development tools, you know, their shader tools, their, their, their editor, and, and their modeling, and Hard. their level design tools, they're, they're excellent. They're awesome. They're AAA level, super awesome. So if you start seeing smaller developers use Unreal to create games that look better than Unity's games, people are going to start paying attention and they're going to start shifting uh, you know, they're going to use the tool that's going to allow them to make the most money. Um, and really that's, that's what it comes down to is Unity is going to be just as relevant, um, if not more, in the future, but they're also, they're also going to have some really strict competition from the likes of Unreal or CryEngine. And developers, they're going to use whatever tool they're comfortable with, and most importantly, whatever tool is going to allow them to maximize their profits. Um, and I think you're going to start to see some mobile games made by Unreal um, in the not so distant future. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, it is interesting. It's, it's awesome that Epic gives away the source code for 20 bucks. And that's one thing you don't get with Unity. I, I don't even know how much it would cost to go get the Unity source code. And, but at the same time, when I was at GDC, I'd walk around and I looked at the Nintendo booth. And about a third of the Nintendo booth is all Unity games. <laughs> like, oh, this is where like Unity, they're sharing that area with Nintendo. Cool. Then I walk about two aisles over in the expo, and then there's a solo Unity booth. So yeah. Unity's had a big presence here, and then they've just got this ginormous booth, and it's filled with people. And I start walking around the middleware vendors. And if you do that, you see all the bullet points on why you should buy their middleware, the best sound system, best graphic system, the best AI. And every single middleware vendor that I saw always had a bullet point, Unity supported. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I realized like, okay, you know, I thought Unity was a good platform, but I realized how ubiquitous, like Unity yeah. is everywhere. And I'm a little, pessimistic. I would hope that nothing bad would happen, yeah. but I could see if Unity took over the whole industry and there was no competition, it would no longer make sense for Unity to offer um, what, whatever they're charging developers now to go and use it, and they could crank up the price, and that's what would happen. Same thing with Epic. Epic had to offer Unreal 4 at $20 because they need to stay competitive with Unity. If Unity was not blowing up right now, I would be very surprised if Epic would have that offer. So, it's competition is good, is a short story. What's what the future is going to be? I don't know, it's anyone's guess. Right. Like, Ten years ago, Gamebryo was, they were the big dogs, and now no one uses Gamebryo. So, see which way the wind is blowing in a few years. I think they broke it. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah, so, you mentioned that it's kind of difficult to get funding for your operations. How do you guys do it? <laughs> we don't. We don't. A lot of blood. Honestly, um, <laughs> I, I mentioned earlier in the talk that you know Baltimore is a city that's that had a lot of businesses sort of fly out of here. Um, and for big, that's just opened up so many doors for us. There are so many people willing to talk to us and offer us you know spaces for free, offer us free office space. Um, free, you know, places with internet, um, people willing to just engage because they see young, committed, and honestly, 
uh, motivated individuals trying to do something, and they just they just want to they just want to be part of that. They want to empower that. Um, for example, what sort of businesses are you saying lead? I know there's converged spaces where like blue collar jobs that were factories, right? Yeah, that's, 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 what, I mean. that's what I meant. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Like just just like large sections of the city that used to be factory work now are just empty buildings. You know, they're really used for anything. And, what comes to mind specifically is the Baltimore Robotics Center, um, run by Ed Mullen, and it's just a giant building with internet access, and it has you know projectors and internet, and they basically they stay there and do events totally for free, um, and we're hoping to partner with them to host some events at, at the building as well, and it's awesome. It's it's a great opportunity for developers or for small communities to take advantage of. I think you just boot like you just bootstrap a lot of it. I mean, you know, it's you know nights and weekends. You know, you and a partner just working on stuff. Um, the goal would be to love to have some type of funding, however you can get it. Maybe you can go friends and family, and they can help you out. But to be honest, most of us we work on a day, and that helps fund the night job and the games that get out there. Usually funded by some day jobs. I mean, that's honestly how you do it now. Um, but I think it's just you know. Everyone can find different opportunities to do it. I mean, there's, if you really, really want to find money, you can spend, instead of working on a game, you can go out and try to find some money. And you might, you probably find some. But again, if you're spending four months trying to find money for your project, then that's four months that you're actually working on the project. Mm -hmm. So you gotta just kind of decide, like, what, at the end of the day, you know, is spending four months, four months getting that project out there is better served? You know, then actually like trying to get money, then you gotta get a team member, then you gotta work out the legalities between two team members. So it's you know, those decisions come into play. So it just depend on like you as a person, like what's your end goal to like really get this I oh go ahead. That's the same when, when I got out of college, like I, I wanted to be a game developer since third grade. So my career path was set <laughs> and back then the only option was a computer science degree. Or that was the primary if I wanted to design and develop games. As soon as I got out of college, I did not start in the game industry. I was working downtown here at Sylvan Prometric doing computer um, testing software. And then after that, after seven years of that, I switched to another job and to another job and another job. But I started indie developing during that time. And a lot like what, what Gabe had said about just trying to do your day job to go and find the money. That's how it was. Like I was at home at night after programming, you know, 40 hours a week, but eight hours in a day in my basement working on a open source Zelda project. <laughs> and you just have to persevere. And if you don't have other obligations in your life, or you can at least shuffle your life around to make the time to do it, then then do it because it's very easy to have life creep in. And to some degrees, you almost have to be a bit of a hermit to get started. And if you can find a like-minded team member, someone that you can work with, um, fantastic, that's great, as long as you're all working to get stuff done. Because I've also had times where I've had people come over on a Sunday, we try to develop a time. Sometimes they'd be very uh, effective, and we'd get work done on our own pet projects. Other times we all get together and half the time people put up YouTube videos and Facebook and like, look at this crazy cat, oh my goodness. <laughs> and, which is fun, it's great, but you know, you, sometimes you have to decide between having social and having community and getting a project done. And sometimes they overlap, but for the most part a lot of it's going to go and be a bit antisocial as you work to go and actually make a game. Yeah, and I just want to point out that the traditional model of getting a game funded still works. It's very difficult, but it still works. If you can find a small team or if you can really huddle and, and make something amazing and then somehow find the money to go to a convention like GDC or PAX or um, any, you know, or E3 or any of these conventions, um, you can get a, publish, a publishing deal and you can get funded. Um, I know, for example, um, one developer dude, uh, this was a while ago in Xbox Live time, uh, when the, the Xbox first came out, the Xbox 360, um, one guy made a game called Dishwasher Samurai, and it was just him. One dude made the art, 
the graphics and everything. And he got Microsoft to give him a big fat check to do that, um, to spend a year doing that. Um, more recently, a project that I backed on Kickstarter actually canceled their Kickstarter because they found a publisher. A project came called the Jet Getters, yeah. um, which you know it proves that if you have an idea that is awesome, that people latch onto, um, and you have the capacity to execute that idea, and that's that's really the point here is that um, what Transfer mentioned to huddle and, and to get it done and to get the education to find a partner, all of those things are basically the preparation to be able to execute on an idea very well. Um, you need to be able to execute before you can have any chance of either finding funding or doing a successful Kickstarter campaign. I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, like a mobile social game on Kickstarter asking for 20 grand, and I'm just like, what are you doing? Moms and, and kids don't go on Kickstarter to back games. You, you need to have the right execution to get money on Kickstarter. Um, so you need to get the experience and you need to have all of the all the components, all the you know, all the preparation done in order to be able to successfully make a living at making games. Um, with that said, I wish it was easier, you know, I wish there was a more um, a more straightforward answer to just, you know, hey, go go to this office, talk to this person and he'll help you get started on how you can get funding or how you can start a company or how you can find a team. But unfortunately, that infrastructure doesn't exist here in Baltimore yet. Um, but hopefully, it will in the future. Um, my son's actually the gamer, not me. But I have a question. With the advent of pretty much every school now coming up with some sort of a gaming program, high schools are kicking out kids that are trained completely. I've even seen kids on campus programs as, as young as seven years old teaching design. Do you see the market getting so flooded that there's going to be issues with getting jobs in the future? And if so, what can someone do to kind of make them stand out rather than just this run-of-the-mill kid? The, the market, the traditional market is, is very tough to get into. That's where you get a job, AAA studio, you're working on a big project that's coming out on the latest gen consoles or, or PC. And but what is fantastic is there are new emerging markets which are occurring. It's a very exciting time because we still are trying to figure out like what's going on with mobile. I mean, it's still very easy for a one or two man team to make a high quality game the AAA studios are just really starting to invest this last year or two to get into that. Middleware such as Unity and Unreal, the fact that anyone for $20, no longer do you need to spend $300,000 or $500,000 to get these tools, are empowering a lot of people to get games right out to the consumers. So they don't need to even get a job at a studio. They can directly market it to uh, an individual through something such as Kickstarter or using a incubator or accelerator, all these other methods. And due to a variety of paths, that just opens up more options. As for how to differentiate in any of the markets or even going for the studios, it's just a matter of making more gains, spending more time, and being dedicated to the craft and trying to pay attention to to the polish at the very end. The more polish a, a finished product can be, the more of attention it will get at studios, the more likely it will be successful inside of the market. Because while there are a lot of places that have game programs, I mean, I went to a friend's computer camp, later became the director of that, and you know, we had video games making on Apple IIe's way back then. But no one would buy any of the games that any of the campers made because they were they were, this, the, uh, they were quite simple. And so while, these student, while the schools have enough time to go and teach the fundamentals, there are very few programs, some of them are out there, but that actually can go and have a student project, even a two-year project span, create something that would be commercially viable. Does it take it beyond that? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to make successful commercial games. It is very, very difficult, and it takes a long time. Um, and to address your concern of the markets becoming overly competitive and stagnant, 
Um, we've already we're seeing that, and we've we've seen that happen. You know, the market there was a crash on the market in 1980s where you know making games became so easy that people were just rushing into it and selling products that were really low quality and. and Consumers really got burned from the idea of paying so much money for products that weren't so great. Um, and right now we're seeing also a little bit of a stagnation in the market in terms of mobile games where so many games are copies of each other. You know, the Flappy Bird phenomena or the Angry Bird phenomena where games, the, the mechanics of the games are copied and the graphics change. Um, and, and people sort of get tired of, of paying for those types of games. Um, but all the, the stagnation and, and the copying and, and the, the lack of innovation, all of that does is create the opportunity for someone with a brand new, fresh idea to come in and disrupt the whole thing. Okay, like for example, Humble Bundle. I don't know if any, any of you are familiar. It's, it's a new market, a new way of selling um, bundles of independent games uh, with a component to donate to charity. And people love that, you know, these games that they wouldn't even pay 20 cents for, now they're paying $100, $200, or even, you know, most people pay $2, $3, and donate millions of dollars to charity. That is just a brilliant invention by one, one guy who works at, who used to work at an independent developer that saw an opportunity in the market, saw the market stagnate, and, and capitalized on it. Um, so anytime you have a, a serious market stagnation where there's a lack of innovation or where the consumer is getting tired and burned of, of buying the same type of product or um, where they're not getting what they want, it just creates the opportunity. It creates opportunities for anybody with a fresh idea who's paying attention and most importantly, who can execute on the idea, who's prepared to execute, who spent all the time in school and outside of school preparing to execute on an opportunity to jump in and really capitalize. So, so to uh, start off where Sam left off, I think he's exactly right. I mean, um, a student really shouldn't be thinking about like how I'm going to get a job when I get out. They should be thinking about <laughs> why would someone hire me when I get out. And so if you think like that, you kind of position yourself, you know, by doing a lot of projects, being involved. And um, you kind of create your own resume and portfolio of people seeing like, wow, this, this kid is really impressive, um, you know, and, and they will pretty much, you know, give you that opportunity. So you're creating those opportunities as you go and as you go, um, you know, go through school. Um, for me, um, to be honest, like game design degrees don't do anything for me. I'm like, you know, if a school tells you they teach game design, then that's not a school that I would go to. Um, I would look at the program and see what do they teach individually in their classes, like what would a student be learning? Um, because I think specific skills is better than saying, I'm going to teach you how to design a game. Because to be honest, game design in itself is just a process that is learned. You can't really, you know, you can't just say, design a game this way and this way and it'll be successful. It's, it doesn't work like that because you can create um, this first person shooter and it's gonna get a million dollars. Or you can all of a sudden have Flappy Bird go get a gazillion dollars. So, you know, in that sense, I would think, you know, you look at, you really have to like analyze the program and say like, you know, at the end of this, what what skills am I gonna have? You know, I, and that's it. I, I just wanna um, bounce off of that though, because I think game, game design programs or, or involving games in education is awesome. Because it gets kids interested. Kids love to play games. Um, for example, I went to a middle school as part of their STEM program recently, a science, technology, education, math. Um, and what they were doing is they, they're having kids go to this website and, and basically learn how to program by typing instructions and having a little character move around. And that's not really learning how to program. You know, they, there's so much more to being a programmer than then typing uh, some instructions go up, go down, move left, move right. But it gets kids interested, it gets kids engaged, and it, it, it makes, it opens up the, the, the process of developing a game. It, it, it turns it from a black box into, oh, this is possible, I can do this now. Um, so I'm always excited anytime I see games being involved in education. The only thing I do agree with Gabe, you have to be sort of cognizant of the fact that there are some schools that will try to use their game development programs as a way to get revenues from students 
and really don't leave them as well prepared because uh, a lot of game development is programming, which you can get at any traditional computer science degree, or you know graphic design, which you can get at specific specialized schools that do that. Um, but there's also, I, I know there are schools that provide really spectacular game design programs like DigiPen, for example, um, at which, which you see a lot of teams of students come out with a finished product or with a product that is ready for polish. For example, I know um, just from DigiPen, Narbacular Drop was a game that came out several years ago from a team. They got hired straight into Valve to develop Portal. And that was a huge success. They hired the whole team from the same school. Another game called Distance, which ran a Kickstarter. It's a racing game, ran a Kickstarter, raised 60 grand, and they got a publishing deal for that. And yet another game from the same company, from the same school, um, Octodad. You know, a game about being an octopus in disguise and having and raising a family. Um, all these games start off as small prototypes, but the teams worked so well together that they continue developing it after they leave school, find a way to raise the money somehow, whether it's through a publishing deal, through getting hired at a company, or through running a Kickstarter, and do very well. Um, it's a matter of doing what you love, and if you have a good team and uh, there's and, and you like what you're doing, keep it up and, and add that polish. And that's what, like Trancer said, that's what really gets people's attention. I think one caveat to that too, though, is whether the whether it's a good, um, I'll make this really quick. If, it, if it's a good school, bad school, you will get out what you put into it. So. Okay, uh, that's about all the scheduled time we have. You're welcome to hang out and chat further after this, but I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out. Thank you, Trancer, Sam, and Gabe. And thank you guys for your great questions. Um, our next event will be at 7 p.m. Uh, Want me to take this offline, Sam? Uh, the associate yeah, yeah, yeah.